That's it. No more Mr. Nice Duck. Huh? Let the female creature go. Every duck's got his limit, and you scum have pushed me over the line. Jimmy, do you like to see what I see? A talking duck? Yeah, that's it. I've been doing too much toot. <laughs> no one laughs at a master of quack foo. Hey, Powers, welcome back to the show. I'm Mark. Hey, and I'm Des. And this is going to be a spoiler-full podcast about Howard the Duck from 1986. So this is a movie that came out in 1986. And, oh my god, how many years? It's like 37 years, isn't it? Uh, Yeah, sounds about right. That's yeah, good 37 math. years. Uh, all right, so this movie came out 37 years ago. And uh, Des and I have known each other for a long time. And he kind of brought it up on a Facebook post saying, hey, this is the date that <laughs> Howard the Duck came out. And I thought, hold on, I've mentioned this way too many times on Panels to Pixels podcast. And I actually mentioned it to our mutual friend, Ben, saying, and I questioned him saying, hey, what's the first unofficial Marvel cinematic movie that came out based upon a Marvel comic? And I didn't phrase it in that way, but mm -hmm. it is truly this particular film for the fact that this is the first ever Marvel product that was put in from a comic book to cinematic form in theaters. And then Ben goes, well, typically no. I was like, yeah, well, you know, with you got Doctor Strange that was put to TV we had the Incredible Hulk on TV. We had Spider Man on TV too in 1978. Or there was a couple Captain America movies on TV yeah, ex as well too, and into the 90s too. They had actually Captain America movies that were direct to video or even cable at certain points too. But this was the first and only one that was directly to theaters before we got Blade. So. I, I thought, all right, you know what? We've talked about it so much on this podcast, and I have a little bit of a love for this film, for the fact that it, it just touches my heart, and, and the fact that I was a, a teenage boy and I had to go see it in the theater. But we'll go that more into after I talk about the synopsis, because I, I'm, I'm kind of like jumping ahead. All right, just to give you a synopsis, and before we get into the synopsis, yes, this is a spoiler filled film. So if you have not seen Howard the Duck from 1986, <laughs> stop the podcast now, go watch it, and you could come back and complain to me that you either hated it or loved it. Either or. It's either love or hate. A lot of people have a love-hate relationship with the movie, and I understand it. But the synopsis of the film is, in this film based on the comic book character howard the duck is suddenly beamed from duck world a planet of intelligent ducks with arms and legs to earth where he lands in cleveland there he saves rocker beverly played by leah thompson from thugs and forms a friendship with her she introduces him to phil played by tim robbins i think this is his first big major film yep debut who works at a lab with scientist Dr. Jenning, played by Jeffrey Jones. When the doctor attempts to return Howard to his world, Jenning instead transfers an evil spirit into his own body. So that's directly from IMDb. So as you panelers know, I have another podcast and I'm trying to do this very similar to Adrenaline for older films. So this is an older film. This is from 1986. And here's where we would know the movie stars from so uh leah thompson we know from back to the future red dawn all the right moves a whole bunch of other movies that are out there too tim robbins from shawshank redemption just to give a, an idea 
Jeffrey Jones from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. He played the principal that, you know, went after Matthew Broderick, Ed Gale, and Jordan Prentice. Honestly, this was the only thing. I couldn't find too much more about them, but they both played Howard the Duck. Ed Gale is a known little person that's out there in the world that has played in Star Wars films and a- any little person kind of uh, films that are out there from the 80s. And then Jordan Prentice was uh, a young child at the time. He was a little person as well, but he only played Howard for a certain amount of time. But we will have more information for that for you at the very end, as well as a video for you to go research and look at, too, because there's some behind the scenes stuff about Howard the Duck that talks about Ed Gale and George. Jordan Prentice. Oh, cool. Yeah. And then uh, we have Chip Zine, who voiced Howard the Duck himself. I couldn't really find too much with that, but he did stuff like... Um, he was the baker in Ender the Woods when it first started. He's, he's done a lot of stuff on Broadway. Yeah. 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 He, he's got a, a huge cast, but all you have to do is look for Chip Zine. That's Z-I-E-N. And if you look on IMDb, you could actually find them. Uh, Miles Chapin. Uh, he's a character actor. Uh, I remember mostly from the People versus Harry, uh, Harry Larry Flint, not <laughs> Harry Flint, but you could find that there. He only did a select few movies. Apparently, uh, he didn't really continue acting. And then we have an appearance of the one and only Holly Robinson. <laughs> so for those of us Gen Xers out there, we'll know her from the TV show Twenty One Jump Street, right? Does yep, definitely. Yeah. Love yeah. that show. Yeah, everybody loved that show. And uh, she shows up as one of uh, Beverly's band members. And she uses her voice as well, as well as her musical talents, too, within film. So I, I think that's amazing. And we get these people that create a significant kind of movie. Uh, I think it's very interesting. I hold it in high regard. Just for nostalgic pur- purposes, actually. <laughs> but uh, this is where we get into those thoughts, memories of the movie, when it came out, when we saw it. So, does start us off. When did you see this movie? What was your first thoughts of it? And how does it hold up? Okay, I can't remember what month it came out. I do remember that we went and saw it opening weekend because, and it wasn't like I was a huge Howard the Duck fan, but it was a Marvel property. So that was some draw. Leah Thompson, obviously just Mm -hmm. came off of back to the future, had already seen her in a bunch of movies. So huge crush on her. Yeah. That was another reason to go see it. Mm -hmm. And for, I'm a nerd. I love the music video when it first started playing on MTV. (laughs) (laughs) I, I don't know. This was a Gen X thing where you would watch MTV and they would say, in the next hour, we're going to play A, B, and C. So you'd get your VHS tape ready to go and record the videos you liked. Yep. I had that song on the same video three times in a row for some reason. Just kept recording. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, love the movie. Um, It was my senior year in high school. I can't remember if we'd actually graduated or not. But me and a bunch of friends went and saw it, loved it. Yeah. Well, loved it in quotes because we knew it wasn't, you know, the best movie ever made, <laughs> but we enjoyed it. You know, it, it had that quirk <laughs> to it that had it had the humor, it had the sci fi to it. It had the duck, obviously. Yeah. Uh, it had Howard from the comic transposed from comic book to film. So, yeah, I, I think uh, you're you and I are in the same wavelength on based upon our thoughts about the movie. So, yeah, it, it to me, well, honestly, I have an odd fascination with this movie, even though when it came out, it did not do well. No. <laughs> I, I bought the soundtrack on cassette when it came out. <laughs> I, I still have that cassette somewhere to this day in a cassette case. <laughs> And I saw it when it pr- like that weekend, just like you, uh, does. So, uh, yeah, we can't figure out pinpoint the, the date that it actually came out. I lived in Staten Island, New York at the time, and uh, I saw it at 
I was a freshman in high school. I was 14 years old. So you could tell that, you know, Des is like four years older than I am. So he was a senior. I was a freshman. So uh, I saw it at the New York Lane Theater in Staten Island with my cousin Anthony. And then uh, we both took a train there as we always do because uh you know between between the ages of like 12 and up you wind up taking the train to the ferry to the subway into manhattan to to see new york city and or do anything around the island and uh oddly enough at the time when we saw the movie my mother had said to my my aunt at the time my mother's youngest sister tina and she had, you know, our younger cousins there. They went to meet us and we saw the movie there with them, too, at the same time. So my cousin John is five years younger and my cousin Marissa is like seven years younger than uh, Anthony and myself. Anthony and myself are like pretty much about a year apart. But even still, we, we went to go see it and... I, I thought it wasn't that great. I was entertained and I loved it for what we got from the movie based upon the comic book character. And I collected a lot of these comics too, between the ages of 10. Eight, no, I wouldn't say 10, eight up until I would say about maybe 12. And I used to get back issues because I used to go to this comic book uh, place. Uh, it was uh, Tom's, baseball card and comic book shop in great kills that stood uh the the place was really right next to an arcade and we would go to the comic book shop slash baseball card shop get our comics and then spend our money in quarters <laughs> to the arcade so that's that's my memories filled with this and then when we uh you know by the time the movie had come out I was like, I I have to see this movie. I have to. <laughs> what did they do to this character? So, uh, and all for the fact that it, it it's like the first official Marvel film, and not or unofficial Marvel film, I should say. But the thing was, is that I was like looking forward to seeing that dirty duck on the screen. Foul mouthed, about mouth, yeah, you know, cigar chomping, saying his little sayings on on the screen, and he did to some degree. We did get that, so uh, yeah, I I really, if I look at back then when I first saw the movie, then, and my feelings about it, I enjoyed it. If I look up about it now, being a podcaster and somebody who <laughs> loves film. Yeah, it was a bad film. It's not that great, but it had its character in its comedic moments, had its character in the music moments because uh, Thomas Dolby actually did a lot yeah. of the music for it. And on top of that, the actresses that played in the band did their own music. So I knew that because I owned the cassette and I heard <laughs> Leah Thompson's voice in my ears Throughout those years, I'm and tortured my brother. And my brother Scott will probably be listening to this and going, "Why did you buy that cassette?" <laughs> <laughs> so, and I, I, it's funny too. I still have the soundtrack, like I said, on cassette, but I have it digitally. It still holds some sort of um, nostalgic feel to me for the '80s, the mid '80s at that point, because it was '86, and the fact too that it was the first unofficial marvel film that we got and i i can't stress that even more uh, i'm waiting for george lucas to uh send me a nasty email saying please take this podcast down <laughs> because he was one of the producers of the film so uh yeah that's in later on notes but we will now move on to our top five moments or moments that intrigued us within the film so does yeah do you want to talk about any specific moment within the film that okay. you liked well the movie went off to an interesting start <laughs> because not only do you see one pair of duck boobs you see two yes and all i can think is 
what did we stumble into? I mean, is this what this whole movie is going to be? I mean, and luckily, you know, that was yeah. it. Yeah. The Playduck magazine, the quick boob shot in the bathtub. Correct. And, you were, and we're done with that. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I'm like, people are bringing their kids to this. I mean, if they know Howard the Duck, they know it's going to be a little raunchy. Yeah. But still, it looks like a kid's movie. <laughs> Um, it, it does. Uh, I believe the movie was PG thirteen. Yeah, but the thing is, uh, within the eighties, and this was beyond the point of Gremlins because Gremlins was the first movie that kind of tiptoed on that point of, and it was another couple of movies before that too, that kind of pushed the whole PG thirteen aspect. But uh, as well as cursing, as far, as well as nudity. But there were other movies in the early '80s that that gave us nudity within it, like Dragon Slayer. They had that one moment where the girl, you know, she was acting as a boy, but you saw boobs and the whole naked lady. I was like, <laughs> oh my goodness! But this was one of those particular movies where they actually. Uh, you know, they kind of blatantly state it's PG-13 so they could get away with the language to some degree. Right. And nudity. Well, honestly, it's not really nudity. It's not. It's duck nudity. And <laughs> the one thing to add to that, what you stated in the very beginning, because obviously we got the whole Howard the Duck introduction and he goes and he moves on through you know, where he's sitting in his chair and he moves through and he blasts through the woman's door after he looked at the play duck that had the centerfold. Oh, let's see my little chickadee. Yeah. And then he blasts <laughs> through the woman's apartment next door to him. Who's taking a bath and you see, you know, duck nipples. All right. I didn't know ducks had nipples, but okay. But within his apartment, we do get to see some really cool stuff. So uh, within that, we see some posters on the wall. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so main nest and DC fowls and my little chickadee. We get to see Indiana Jones parody called Breeders of the Lost Stork. Yeah. <laughs> we get splash dance with a duck on the chair, just like Jennifer Beals. And a copy of Rolling Egg magazine. With, uh, like, actually, you know, they, they have, you guys have to actually look at it. I think the guy in YouTube does it justice. And, and but, it's funny because, like, Splash, or what was it? Splash Dance. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. The other ones are all wordplay, but they really make no sense whatsoever with what the movie would be about. <laughs> exactly. Breeders of the Lost Stork. So this guy goes around doing what? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Look, looking for storks. I mean, <laughs> and I find it ob- odd that they use the zip code. It seems to be a New York City one. Okay. Um, but it is listed as Washington, D.C. And I enjoyed the look of the duck world with seeing the people on the streets, like uh, the construction worker. And mm-hmm. they're out there that he has the hard hat looking up as Howard's going by. The people on the elevator. Uh, you got the jock walking around with the weights. At the time, he's got the wristbands, the Daigle wristbands, and everything else working out. There's so much cheesy stuff that's going on there. The one thing that that makes me laugh, too, within that particular scene, before he even, like, he turns on the TV and you get the Feather Itch ad on the TV oh, with yeah. the football players. <laughs> the game where the lady wins the prize with the car, like, very typical of the time within the 80s because everybody wins something. Oh, my God! I won! Oh, oh my god! And then you get the cheesy soap opera. He's dead. With the doctor and the nurse telling him how much she loves him as he's saying, uh, he's dead. (laughs) You know, and then the crazy Webby commercial, which was a take from Crazy Eddie at that time. Now, Crazy Eddie is long gone, but this dates it very much. Crazy Webby! (laughs) <laughs> so, but Crazy Eddie at the time had, it's like, my prices are insane. I, I forget what he says within the particular movie, but honestly, it always gets me every time I see Crazy Webby. 
<laughs> and uh, you know, to me, it's like all those little callbacks date it, but also give the humor that is needed for the particular film too at its time. But when you think somebody had to sit down and design duck boobs, like that was that was their job for the week. You have to design duck boobs. <laughs> I mean, you had the costumer coming up with the, the funny 80s costumes for all these ducks. No, this guy has to make boobs. Yeah. For yeah. a duck. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. All right. So if you if you guys have any talk about duck boobs, nipples, any of that, please leave them in the comments. <laughs> I think we're just going to be cackling about this whole movie the whole time. All right. Um, one that I would have would be Howard needs to get home despite the obstacles with Dark Overlord. He gets help from Beverly and Phil because they believe in him. So uh, I think that is an intriguing thing because he befriends Beverly literally in an alleyway where he gets attacked and he gets thrown in a can. But through the can, he peeps up kind of like a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles thing. (laughs) And then he comes out and he's the master of Quack Fu and takes out these two goons that like look like goths from the early or mid eighties. And they have like little doll heads on their vests or leather jackets as well. I've done too much toot. And he winds up (laughs) protecting her. And uh, yeah, I I think it's pretty cool in a sense that we get to see him in action. Just how who he is as a normal everyday duck in a world full with with hairless apes, I, I guess. And then he winds up taking these guys out. She kind of befriends him and takes him on her way. She doesn't even know what the hell he is. She thinks it's probably <laughs> some little guy in a duck suit. And then winds up getting all this information out of him. And I, I just enjoy that whole aspect. But but the next day, she winds up. This is in my other notes, but we'll talk about that later. But. The next day, she takes him to somebody who she thinks is a professional. (laughs) And (laughs) she takes him to a museum in a garbage can, uh, a garbage bag, in a taxi to go see Phil. And Phil examines him, and he's just an oddball himself. He's not, you're like, all right, who is this guy? But as soon as he starts to talk about the evolution of Duck, or the actual regular duck to modern duck. Howard goes like every school duck knows this. And it's literally, it's like pretty much the evolution of man himself from monkey to who we are now. And I think, I don't honestly, I don't think we've changed that much, but, (laughs) but we uh, get that whole synopsis. But at the very end, it's like he gets called out. (laughs) It's like, that's like, Philzy, are you a scientist or a janitor? <laughs> and then literally, <laughs> it's like we get that whole conversation. And then, you know, Beverly, and then he kind of ostracizes Beverly, which, like, we're kind of going through the movie itself, but it, it's kind of interesting for the fact that he's in this world that, honestly, if I was trapped in a world of ducks, I'd be like, what the hell is going on? Who the hell are you? Oh, my God, you're talking my language. And that's literally how it feels with this particular film. But you're seeing it through Howard's eyes, but we're also seeing it through our eyes as humans. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of jaded in some way. Well, it's kind of funny because you're talking about how they accept him fairly quickly. Yeah, That's, that's the response of everybody in the film. Either they accept him fairly quickly. You know, when when she, when she introduces her introduces Howard to her bandmates, they're like, "Oh, that's cool." You know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's either they think, "Oh, it's cool, no big deal," you're interesting, or you're the devil, you're evil. You know, we have to beat you up and kill you. It's it's no no middle ground, no curiosity. It's just acceptance or let's get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, the 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 character itself does adapt to his situation 
But the fact that, that people just look at them and thinking, uh, I, I, I'm i thinking from the perspective of the people in the show or the movie going, okay, this is a person in a costume that's acting like a duck. But, you know, it's it got to that point where he was like, he was like typical Howard thinking like Howard. It's like, oh, I got to get a job because he kind of <laughs> left Beverly and did his own thing. And then he goes to some job placement place and she goes you are gonna take this to duck the water and it's like <laughs> yeah it's like she goes i know who you are and i it's like yeah it's that typical of like oh you don't want to work and he does want to work but she, she finds him a particular job because of the way he looks and it's in of all things what was it like a greek sp- like bathhouse or something. I don't remember what it was. Um, that sounds about right, though. So yeah, yeah so, for the fact that you get two people in a hot tub, a woman and a man getting it on, he goes, "Oh, <laughs> typical humans breeding," and then he goes, "Oh, I ordered a water jet specialist," and then the owner throws him in, and of course Howard can't swim. <laughs> he goes, "Oh, keep on doing what you're doing, do what you're doing," and he gets out. And then he winds up quitting, and then he kicks the owner into a mud bath, which, honestly, uh, you adrenal heads that are out there, we talked about a mud bath in Invasion of the Body Snatchers when Jerry and I <laughs> talked about that. But I have never seen one in the 80s. <laughs> when did this come uh, happen? <laughs> um, I th- th- were they still mud- prevalent? I think they were. Um, When you would see somebody in a spa or something. And I don't think everybody was getting mud baths in real life, but it was something (laughs) in a movie that you could use as a joke. So, so every spa would have a mud bath Yeah, and they would all have the cucumbers on the eyes. It would be the same tropes for every spa you would see. Yeah. So he winds up quitting his job and this and that, and he winds up walking and he's on the streets. It looks like a homeless man in a duck suit. And he winds up walking and he winds up going into the bar that Beverly's playing. And she has a song that kind of touches him because it's kind of somber. Now, mind you, keep in mind, listeners, yeah, uh, Leah Thompson and all the women that were involved did play the instruments, did sing Mm -hmm. for Thomas Dolby. And they did this. So uh, that's why I like the uh, the soundtrack. But uh he gets there and he overhears a conversation with their manager winds up talking to the manager and the manager was talking about, Hey, uh, Beverly, I'll see you later in my bedroom. Ha ha ha. And all this other nonsense. And, uh, Howard kind of takes action, gets them out of the contract, putting a ice pick through his hooped hearing into the bar as he walks on the bar after he got knocked out. And then, of course, the uh, you know the sidekick of the manager goes, well, you know, I told you you're going to be talking with these uh, kind of uh, celebrity types, and uh, yo, uh, they're kind of like this. So he gets them <laughs> out of that contract. He goes backstage, sees the girls, and like you said before, Des, they they kind of treat him like, oh, this is Doc. Oh, this is Howard. Oh, hi, how weird. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, you get the, you know, we get to see Holly Robinson. We get to see Leah Thompson. Leah plays the character as Beverly as normally and appreciating Howard. You know, she was worried about him. They were so glad that he got them out of their uh, contract from uh, their manager. And, of course, Phil comes in with a pizza. And, of course, Howard's like, what is a pizza? And he goes, oh, it's a cylindrical, cheesy object on bread. <laughs> Beside that. <laughs> and, and, and he winds up stealing a feather and then running off to uh, his scientist folks. And then he stays the night with Beverly. And then we get the weird situation, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. You want to talk about that a little bit? I've been talking uh, too much. Well, I mean, obviously, you know, she... See, originally, when she starts coming on to him, it's, I think she's just playing with him. It's not really a sexual thing. At least that's not how I took it at first. It, it was like she was teasing him. And then as it got farther along, then it kind of got, got real. Yeah. 
<laughs> and then Jenning and the other guy who I, I spoke about before, I'm forgetting his name, but uh, he goes, this defies all natural purposes <laughs> and all this. And of course, it's at that moment when Beverly's in a kind of like skimpy top. Uh, panties little tiny panties yeah and uh oh it's like oh my god it's like every guy's uh dream that loved uh leah thompson i was like oh she's scantily clad oh my god but with a duck um mm-hmm. and she's kissing the lips of <laughs> the the beak of the duck so it's like okay you can understand it was a peck and a kiss at that point it could be construed as being um affectionate in the sense of not being sexual but people would put that in the sense of like it being sexual but in the comics in comparison yeah both they are a couple they yeah. are a couple <laughs> and yeah they get down with the dirty which we have seen in panelers as you know and what if with uh oh i'm forgetting the doctor's sidekick's name from thor but oh okay. Yeah. Oh shit! Um, yeah, you knowing it too, Dar- Darcy. <laughs> Darcy, yeah. So Darcy got with it with Howard too, and how weird was that? All <laughs> right, so uh, they kind of like explain the whole situation. Phil, get them the hell out of here, and it got to the point where it's like, oh, Doctor Jenning can get him back. So there's there begins this whole journey of get him getting back <laughs> to his own planet. And that's where things go a little bit chaotic. Right? Oh, yeah. Well, I actually, my number four actually was the quack foo in the alley anyway. That whole scene. There. Oh, yeah. Quack foo. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The master um, quack foo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Once they get in with Jennings and he has his little accident. Yeah. <laughs> that whole, I think we see the real Jeffrey Jones right there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why and that's not? all we'll say. That's all we'll say, exactly. Uh, Jeffrey uh, Jones, as uh, I'll, I'll say this now, uh, he's not a like man. He won't be in Beetlejuice 2. No. No, at all. But uh, I'll say this in a sense of with podcasting about movies that I love, about people that have done some really crappy things in real life. I appreciate the artwork that was done then. Do I appreciate the person who they are in real life being, you know, what they truly are? No, but I could bypass that because I want to watch the movie and enjoy the movie. So I've done this before with other films, too. I mean, every movie made, there is somebody questionable. Correct. You know, so if they're not still profiting from it, What's the point? I don't think he's profiting <laughs> anything from prison, no. so it's okay. Okay, so okay, we're done, done with that. We're done with that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for bringing that up. Um, Sorry. Okay. So the, the thing when Jennings is possessed by the Dark Lord, it's funny because one of my points was the whole diner scene. Oh God! Where, where they're sitting there, you know, <laughs> and the waitress, she's unfazed by Howard. Oh, she's the total bro, dude. <laughs> yeah, coming she's over. Un- <laughs> unfazed by Jennings, whose face is just like sweaty and bruised looking and everything. Dude, but, what your costume is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> but what really gets me is the whole time they're sitting there, Jennings is telling them, mm-hmm. I'm evil. I'm a monster. I'm going to kill everyone. My people are coming over here. <laughs> and they're just like, uh, we need three specials with beers, please. <laughs> yeah, eggs. They're Get unfazed. The eggs, babe. Unfazed. Oh, especially with Howard, he gets the yeah. eggs. He goes, yeah. "Um, I'm having issues here." <laughs> yeah, but just just the fact that they're just he's telling them what he's going to do, and they're just like, yeah. "He needs some help. He needs a, he has a headache or something. There's something wrong with him." But you know, let's yeah. just eat. <laughs> yeah, I, I find it fun just to watch it for the fact of it's like, do you not see the irony in this? <laughs> I'm looking at eggs. Eggs. Get rid of the eggs. <laughs> he does. <laughs> And uh, and also on top of that, it's kind of dated for the fact that if you look at Howard, he's wearing camouflage pants. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Back in the mid 80s, we all wore camouflage back in the day. Yeah, it was like it was a cool <laughs> thing. But I just love the, the scene after that when they escape or he escapes at that point, too. It's like he cuts Phil free of the uh, the handcuffs. 
but he was also posing as a fake duck. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, I dropped my cigar. And that's how he was able to get away from the guys. And they were able to free, and then him and Beverly, and then with, with Phil. And then at a certain point, Beverly gets captured by, um, oh, I'm forgetting who Jeffrey Jones plays uh, at that character, but uh, Jennings. Jennings, uh, yeah. He uh, is the Supreme Overlord. Is that what it is? I think so. I, I probably is. I mean, he was. He kept talking about the Dark Overlords, but he probably was the Supreme One. I don't remember for sure. So he he winds up taking Beverly and hijacking her, and they're going towards the lab. So it, it it's down to Howard and Phil to go after them at night, and then it goes into day at that point. And they wind up hijacking a, a little plane, a biplane that like is like a project plane. Mm-hmm. And Phil's flying it. Howard's hanging on for dear life. And they wind up going through this whole car chase because cars are chasing them at that point. They finally get to the uh, the lab at that point, sneak in. And you could see how the Dark Overlord or Supreme Overlord at that point had hijacked the scientists to get the whole thing to get the more of the dark overlords from their planet to come <laughs> down which was great animation from phil Tippett, which was amazing because you could actually see them as they're coming down but you don't really see jennings turning into the dark overlord at that point or supreme overlord and uh when it gets to that point that's when howard gets into action to go against this so it's like it's okay that's when it gets a little bit strange so like how does this little duck that looks like donald the duck which disney sued marvel <laughs> over yeah is white but should be kind of like a mallard at this point yeah which we have in the mcu which is voiced by seth green now mm-hmm. by the way everybody it looks much more comic accurate <laughs> Much more comic accurate and with the attitude, too, in the What If episode, too, by the way. So at l- we get more Howard out of that. We do get to see a little bit of him. I'm, I mean, a walk on in Endgame. So you have to yeah. pause it very particularly <laughs> in Endgame to see Howard, everybody, all you panelers. And then uh, on top of that, later on in Guardians of the Galaxy and everything else, too, he, he made his appearances then. And I think in all three films at, at certain points. But he kind of takes on the Dark Overlords, uh, blows it up, the, the the telescope that is pulling everything down. And then he winds up having a life on Earth with Beverly and the rest of them being their manager. Yeah. So he's got a life. He's got a life. So it's kind of interesting, kind of fun. It was meant to be a PG 13 film, but kind of PG in some aspects to grab the younger crowd. Mm -hmm. But I think they were in that middle point where it's like, this ain't going to work. And it (laughs) didn't, it didn't really work, but it only works in nostalgia in the sense of the comic book readers People who were within their teens at that time that loved goofy, stupid little crap like this, like I did, (laughs) or even with Des, if probably if he went, you know, you probably went out with a bunch of friends going, oh, I need to go see this movie just to see what it's like. And you're like, why did I go see this movie? But it was (laughs) kind of, it, it had its funny moments. And that's the whole thing. Oh, we saw worse movies that year. I'll tell you. <laughs> oh yeah, there were a ton. I I know. I I don't remember half the movies. Like, oh well, eighty six had a lot. Actually, we- I think Rima and I covered a movie from eighty six. Which one? Uh, I'm trying to remember. Was Lost Boys out in eighty six? Uh, I think so. If not, very close. All right, so I'm gonna look this up real quick. Um. Because I'm thinking I went and saw that us. with the same group of friends. So I, I'm trying to look up exactly what came out in 86 right now. And I'm thinking uh, movies that came out in 1986. So, all right. We got Little Shop of Horrors. We had oh. American Tale, Short Circuit, 
Three Amigos, Highlander, Ferris Bueller's Days Off. That was uh, a good year. <laughs> uh, it was a good year. Stand By Me, Big Trouble in Little China, which we did cover on Adrenaline Cinema Podcast. Platoon. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of particular films that came out within that year. Top Gun was one of them. Yeah. Aliens, Labyrinth, Hoosiers, Blue Velvet. Yeah. Yeah, the, there was a lot that came out that year. <laughs> Tell you what, and that's a, a lot more variety than we actually have now, to be honest with you. If you look at the spectrum of those movies, and and most of them did fairly well. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, like Cobra with Sylvester Stallone, One Crazy mm-hmm. Summer, The Color of Money, another Tom Cruise movie. Yeah. The Karate Kid Part 2. Jason would love that from Podcastica. <laughs> the Wraith with Charlie Sheen. Oh, I forgot about that. Oh, that that's a good movie. That's something that we're going to do on a drown soon. Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> I already said Short Circuit. The Golden Child with Eddie Murphy. For you horror fans, uh, Maximum Overdrive. Okay, there we go. We got a stinker. <laughs> yeah. Uh, back to school. Back yeah, to school. Rodney. Rodney Dangerfield, uh, the Manhattan Project. All right, uh, for you uh, cartoon enthusiasts and uh, fellow Autobot fans, <laughs> Transformers the movie. I oh, forgot the, about that. The tearjerker. Yep, the tearjerker. <laughs> and when Optimus Prime died. Sorry, spoilers. <laughs> 37 uh, years. <laughs> 37 years later, sorry. Uh, Star Trek for The Voyage Home. Lucas. I okay. remember Lucas with uh, Charlie Sheen, uh, Ethan, uh, not Ethan Hawke. Oh, Corey Haim. Corey Haim and Winona Ryder. Um, oh, and Kelly Green was in it too, wasn't she? Yes, she was. Okay. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre too. <laughs> for those horror enthusiasts. Critters, which is a fan favorite of mine. I yep. love that film. Yep. Uh, About Last Night. Uh rad which i'll be covering <laughs> in the near future on adrenaline cinema podcast young blood with uh rob lowe cynthia gibb and patrick swayze we must have gone to the theater every freaking week uh friday the 13th <laughs> part six jason lives and peggy sue got married nick cage nick cage and <laughs> kathleen turner yep So there was a lot of stuff that came out in 86, but honestly, this lumps into the hit or miss of those particular movies that came in out within that year. So it's either you either love these movies based on the nostalgia of where you are at that time, or you just hated them because they're like, (laughs) I, I went on this date and this guy took me to go see Howard the Duck. And what the hell was that? Or, oh, wow, I got to see all these other cool movies, you know, at that time. You know, 86 was very good for that year, too, for films. So, but, yeah, but this is the year that Howard the Duck came out. (laughs) So so you mentioned the attack from the Dark Overlords. That, I mean, yeah, it's the animation of it today does not look great. No. 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 It, well, you have to realize it was stop motion photography. Yeah, oh. which makes me think of the old Sinbad movie. Yeah. With, with with the skeletons and stuff. But the character design of the Overlord, where you're looking basically at a face, and then he looks up, and then there's this <laughs> other face. <laughs> it was it was a really cool character design. Yeah, that it was. It was a cool character design. It was based upon well, it, it's Phil Tippett, so Obviously, with Phil, he sets forth with uh, his stop motion photography. Mm -hmm. So with that, you actually have to deal with that. That, That's his forte. Everything came from Star Wars. We got to see the Tauntauns, all that stuff. Our friends, uh, Paik and Daphne, had done one about Phil Tippett recently on podcasts get for run for your lives i forget wanting what what it's called oh mad god oh and it was a movie that was in production for years but it was all stop motion photography and it had so many social 
commentary undertones throughout the whole movie and made you not want to watch it because <laughs> you felt honestly i felt sick halfway through it my friend rob owns it on steelbook blu-ray okay <laughs> and i bought the book but the book is about phil Tippett's life about stop motion photography so this is kind of like the end of an era of stop motion photography at that time before by the 90s where we got you know digital animation and phil was the forefront of stop motion photography and giving us this so that that was the animation we got we got blue screen everything facial animatronics for howard himself with ed gale and jordan prentice yeah so they both were in that suit Jordan being the young child at that point walking around in Howard, but having the animatronics in it and that being a problem with him doing all the adult stuff, but also dealing with all the mechanisms that's going on his head and his head as he has the helmet on. Then you had Ed Gale, who is a uh, little person that's been around for years dealing. He was an Ewok. He was probably in Time Bandits. I have to really research that, but I wouldn't be surprised if he wasn't. Mm -hmm. And then he had that experience. So he was pretty, pretty much like the stunt double for Jordan. And uh, you had those animatronics in there in that head for Howard to do the voices where the, the mouth would mimic like speech and vocal. And that was a testament to its time too. And where, you know, kind of furthered more into with, with Jim Henson when he did Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the movie. So it kind of furthered into that. So uh, this was kind of like the early years before that happened. And, uh, yeah, it, it's kind of innovative for its time. Mm -hmm. And nowadays we don't think much of it. Right. You know, Eventually, I'll be doing Total Recall with Jason Cabassi when we do that on Adrenaline Cinema Podcast. And there's a lot of stuff in that particular movie that has practical effects like that with the uh, kind of the helmet with the mechanics going on in it. And we'll talk about that then. But uh, this was innovative for its time. It had the backing of Lucasfilm or, well, George Lucas as being producer. So, um that that's something we'll get into but uh the way the movie ends obviously uh you know you know howard you know is the manager of beverly and the girls and cherry bomb mm -hmm. gets complete success phil is there to do all the effects that are out there whether it be the mixing the mm -hmm. lighting rig and all the effects and he screws it up and at the, at the very end we get a music scene with howard coming <laughs> yeah. out during the song called what other than howard the duck, duck. so yeah uh, which was the music video that des and i remember too from that particular <laughs> movie uh that was on mtv and uh yeah yeah it, the movie itself like i said i enjoyed it for its nostalgic as i look at it now at the time i was excited for it because mm -hmm. being a comic book fan and i I bought the comic when I was like eight. Who would let an eight-year-old buy this comic? <laughs> Obviously, my parents would because to, to shut me the hell up. And it looked like, you know, Daffy Duck, which, you know, Disney tried to sue Marvel over at a certain point. And, and then he had to change concepts, too, within the comic. And then, you know, the, then we got to now, and I still love the music. The mm -hmm. music still holds to that 80s premise. And I, I love the soundtrack because uh, Thomas Dolby did great with the mixing and recording, getting the girls to sing. The character, I still think, has the same attitude of Howard. It just doesn't look like him. Right. The story is kind of crap, <laughs> but humoristic in a sense that I could look back at it and just watch it and just laugh at it and recite it because I've watched it so many times. But that that's just me. And, uh, and Des, what do you think about it to this day now, right now, if, after you watched it? Again? It's a hard watch now as a 55 year old. You know, it's I enjoyed it then. Like I said, huge crush on Leah Thompson. Yeah, we but all like, did. <laughs> but, but now I look at it 
And she had such a slight build. Yeah. It feels kind of creepy now. She yes. was tw- she was 25 when they made it, but she just seems so young. In she hindsight, she's a lot younger so than young. who she was. And you have to realize too, at the same time that this was happening, that this was happening within two to three years at the time that she was doing Back to the Future, mm-hmm. Red Dawn, this, and then years be- like I would say about four years before she was doing all the right moves with an actual nude scene which yeah now i really can't watch because because I mean, you you feel like she, a perv right? I mean, and she was legal then too but i yeah I, it even bothered me then yeah for some reason um but, and then with this and she's on skimpy lingerie and you're like oh my god what the yeah. <laughs> and i wonder if she was worried about typecast because she goes from this huge movie where she's trying to make out with her son <laughs> to another movie where she's making out with a with duck, a duck. <laughs> and yet her daughter plays in zombie land too yep zoe yep and i watched that going wait that's leah thompson's daughter yeah oh my it- god she, uh, she but honestly her character in that particular movie her daughter's character in zombie land too i i really did enjoy <laughs> oh she, she's actually i love the first zombie land i like the second one but she yeah. was one of the best parts of the second one i think yeah <laughs> she had a peanut allergy yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah and it shows that uh i guess talent does go through the genes uh-huh. too so she was able to do that very much like how uh kurt russell and white russell are Oh or, yeah, uh, doing work too in Marvel too, and now in Godzilla at this point too. Now that that's been exposed, and I really do enjoy that. Uh, all right, I'm just gonna move right along right now because we basically covered the whole movie and went <laughs> basically yeah. for like kind of scenes per scenes. But additional notes. Do you have any other notes that you didn't bring up? Um, really. Um, oh. There were a couple other cast members of note okay. in this movie. Not such, not as big a parts. Paul Guilfoyle hmm. is the lieutenant that's going after him. Brass yeah. from CSI. Yep. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> when I was watching it, I'm like, where do I know that voice? And then I'm looking, and of course, you know, he's way younger and way thinner than he was on CSI. I'm like, yeah. is that f- is that freaking brass? And then he like turned his face like it's freaking brass. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and th- then we have uh, I still I never pronounced the last name right. We have Liz Sagel or mm. is it Sagel or Siegel? Ka- Sagel, Katie Siegel's one of her sisters. She has twin sisters. Oh, two K- sisters. Katie Seagal from Seagal. Yeah, from Pretty right. Children and yeah. All right, Futurama voice actress. Yeah, yep. but she has two sisters that are twins, younger than her. But she plays Ronette, the Caucasian band member that she has. Yes, um, the redhead. Yeah. And then we also have Dominique Devalos, who plays Cal, who's, who was a, the other girl in the band. But she's mm-hmm. an actual singer and bass player. Yep. Uh, she has been like in a long list of bands. Mm-hmm. Uh, dominatrix the delphines and i think most recently dogs and diamonds so she's like an actual talented performer Musician. going yeah. into it and since then oh cool we also got miguel sandoval oh wow I who's forgot. done tons of movies yeah a, a few spike lee movies do the right thing jungle fever where most of the times i saw him was on the tv show medium mm-hmm. where she was kind of his boss he's kind of the medium's boss but the one thing that stands out to me, it's a teeny tiny part he had in Jurassic Park <laughs> where he's got the piece of amber that has the mosquito in it and he's showing it to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. Other than um, quotes, I don't have any other notes besides that. Uh, the only note that I would <laughs> state, and I will be putting this in the notes, listeners. Uh, there is a mini documentary that someone has put together on YouTube. It's called The Disastrous History of Howard the Duck. <laughs> and it's presented by Yesterworld Entertainment. So you can find that on YouTube. I will be putting it in the notes on the podcast notes 
as well as the YouTube notes, because I, I know we have a bunch of listeners and viewers that uh, follow us on YouTube as well as on the podcast uh, apps that are out there. So uh, all you have to do is click click the link and it will bring you to it. But other than that, that's all I had. Now we're going to be moving on to, of all things, like Des already stated, quotes. <laughs> okay. So uh, what quotes do you have, Des? Well, there was one from uh, Howard. You're a dead man, Ginger. Space rabies, you know? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, this one would be from Howard after uh, to Beverly after he haphazardly way of bringing Howard to Phil, who is a janitor, or uh, it was Beverly bringing him to uh, Phil. It would say if you got blasted millions of miles through space, ended up another planet and were given an IQ test by a janitor, you'd be a little pissed off. too. <laughs> yeah, I would. Yeah. And uh. Beverly asked him if he has somewhere to go. He said, hey, if I had some place to go, I certainly wouldn't be in Cleveland. Cleveland. <laughs> yeah. Which I agree with as somebody who's outside of Cincinnati. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one would be Phil's impersonation of Duck speaking, trying to <laughs> communicate with Howard when he says... <laughs> <laughs> Wiki wiki wiki. <laughs> oh god, that drove me nuts. <laughs> if you had only done it one time, it would have been one thing. But yeah. If God had intended us to fly, he wouldn't have taken away our wings. Yep, very true. This one is from Phil when they're on the glider flying through the homemade glider and uh Howard's hanging on and he says, "Oh, uh, Howard's flying at this point. How, uh Phil is hanging on. Uh, it's the opposite." And Howard goes, Howard, Doc, and proud <laughs> of it by Howard. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is part of the creep factor. <laughs> Howard oh, said, when, when Beverly is kind of like snuggling up with Howard, he says, I've got a headache. And she goes, and I've got the aspirin. <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> oh. All right, this one's from Howard. Uh, No, no, no. Actually, no. This one is from Thomas Dolby during the song Howard the Duck. Oh. Hickory dickory, dickory duck. duck. <laughs> Ain't about to get plucked. Too groovy for gravy. Too precious for pate. Uh, apparently, Thomas was very much influential and very much giving within this film when it came to the music. So that that's why henceforth state watch the documentary because he has a lot to do with it. That's why when when they play the song at the very end, I was very upset the first time that they didn't have that little insert in the song. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you have another one? I, I'm all quoted out. I have one last quote, and then this one's from Howard as he walks out of the museum with Beverly being pissed off about Phil. And a woman screams with her kid while she's walking the stroller going, ah! When she sees Howard going, and Howard just says, typical Harold Sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was like pretty cool and niche, yeah. but <laughs> they had to say that at some point. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, uh, as you listeners know from Adrenaline Cinema Podcast, this is what I like to do on that particular podcast, but I'm putting it in here now because there's a lot of cool stuff that comes about or facts about the movie Howard the Duck. Uh, so this is interesting or unknown facts about the movie Howard the Duck. So I'm going to start off with the first one. And the first one states, John Lannis could have directed it. So Howard the Duck began life as a surrealistic comic book. Conceived by Marvel writer Steve Gerber, Howard made his debut in 1973 of the Adventure into Fear series, and he came with a wild backstory. Born in another dimension, the anthropomorphic bird ended up being stranded on Earth, where he didn't exactly blend in. Throughout the 1970s, this odd duck would appear in many other comics, which is how he caught the eye of George Lucas, who decided to produce a movie about him. Originally, Lucas wanted his friend John Landis in the director's chair, 
a great comedic filmmaker. Landis had helmed Animal House, The Blues Brothers, An American Werewolf in London. Definitely a great podcast on it. Uh, Run for Your Lives had covered American Mm -hmm. Werewolf London, just to let you guys know. And to continue on, he states, and trading places. But Landis turned down this particular project. Quote, unquote, my greatest regret in my career is that John Landis was unable to direct Howard the Duck. Lucas later said, he states, I feel the movie would have been far more successful and saved me the years of hardship following its release. So basically, yeah, George regrets it. (laughs) (laughs) I wonder if, I mean, I know it was a bomb, but I wonder if George's definition of hardship is the same as the rest of us. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Uh, The next one does. Okay, well, George Lucas wanted the film to be animated. After Landis said no, uh, Willard Hike, 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 (laughs) who co-wrote the script with his wife, Gloria Katz, was tapped as the film's director. Production began in the mid-1980s. At first, Lucas and his screenwriters envisioned Howard the Duck as an animated movie. However, Universal Studios had other ideas. We really wanted it. We really wanted to animate it, Katz said on the DVDs making of that documentary. But Universal needed a picture for the summer of 1986. Animation is, of course, a lengthy process, and a hand-drawn film could have ta- couldn't be made that quickly. So George said, well, we can build a duck. We can do it with the technology we have, Catch recalled. <laughs> and this is what we got. Legendary Marvel movie. All right, yeah. next up, uh, <laughs> Martin Short and Robin Williams auditioned for The Voice of Howard. Oh, my goodness. Does Ben know about this? I bet he does. <laughs> All right. So uh, it says John Cusack also tried out. Ultimately, though, it was Broadway star Chip Zion, an original Into the Woods cast member who delivered Howard's lines. Doesn't go further more into it, but apparently Martin Short and Robin Williams both auditioned for it. They probably were like, no, nope, we're not doing yeah. it. I mean, by 86, Robin Williams probably could have done whatever he wanted to. You know? I, I would say so, too. <laughs> okay. Leah Thompson took guitar lessons during production. Both the movie and the comics gave Howard a human girlfriend. In the former, his non-avian love interest was played by Back to the Future's Leah Thompson. Since her character, Beverly, leads a rock band, the actress had to brush up on her musical skills. I had to learn how to play guitar, she told Decider. We shot the movie for six months, and I never had a day off. I was always rehearsing or recording or doing something. I was so exhausted by the end. Yeah, I would be, too. Mm -hmm. Kind of rushed into everything. But I I think that's how uh, filming was done back in the uh, 80s at that point. Next up, Tim Robbins thought they could uh, that they got the duck all wrong. Wow. Okay. Uh, the wrong noting that Howard the Duck marked one of the earliest films appearances by future Oscar winning Tim Robbins earlier this year, when asked if he looked back on the project with any fondness, Robbins replied, well, I look back at it and I realized that one of the things I think about was at the time I got this job <laughs> that was paying a really decent salary. And it was uh, for George Lucas, who had just come off of three Star Wars films. So it was a huge deal at the time. And then it wound up going over its shooting schedule. And I wound up getting paid twice for that movie because of all the overtime. So I think more about that and then about the qual- quality of the movie, which he left. I think more about that allowing me the opportunity to do a movie like Five Corners and do and to produce great plays with actor actors gangs because of the money I was able to make on that movie. But Robbins also contended that the movie could have been better if the duck had been better. He goes, I think one of the things that I realized at the time was at least I did from the very first day was that the duck was kind of miscast. He said, we got the rock. <laughs> uh, we got the duck wrong to be in the movie. And I don't mean that that there were inside the suit. I mean, kind of the design and concept, who the character was. In the comic, it was a cigar chomping, rude skirt chasing duck and got kind of 
cutified in the movie. And when I saw that on set, I was worried. I was worried at the start. Yes. Yeah. And I believe that too, <laughs> Tim. I thank you for saying that. And I'm glad somebody posted that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, but the Howard, the Howard suit was incredibly complex. Yeah. Unlike most high tech creature suits that have been built in the past, all of Howard's wires, motors, and batteries were fully contained within his body. A four puppeteer team was in charge of regulating facial expressions via remote control. Apparently, their individual jobs were quite specific. One person was only concerned with the eyes, somebody would be doing the mouth, and so forth. So forth. Hike explained it was a nightmare of coordination. Yeah. Yeah, I have to watch the actual uh, YouTube people. Uh, yeah, I should have a- watched that so I could understand how to say his name. <laughs> uh, I would say Hayek or Hyuk. Hayek. <laughs> or yuck, you know, but uh, it's kind of hard. I do believe it. Um, they actually go through it. There's actually several documentaries, too, but I only picked that one. But uh, if you guys are really into Howard the Duck, the movie, or trying to get into this, or go to deep dives, or uh, you know, flush that toilet bowl and follow through, <laughs> you could do that too, as well as I like to say. Um, next up, the Dark Overlord monster was created by Jurassic Park's "quote unquote" dinosaur supervisor. So uh, we already mentioned him, but uh, an accomplished stop motion artist, Phil Tippett, designed, constructed, and animated the grotesque final form of Howard the Duck's main villain. Tippett also provided stop motion monsters for the original RoboCop, which we'll be covering soon too, as well, and Return of the Jedi years later. He played a huge role in bringing Jurassic Park's massive digital creatures to life. And you have to watch the end credits and you'll see that Tippett is listed as dinosaur supervisor, <laughs> much to the Internet's amusement. And yes, Daphne and Pake have covered Jurassic Park on Run For Your Lives on the podcast network. So refer to that. And uh, also um, the movie I mentioned before, too about uh, Phil Tippett because they did that movie and I will not watch that movie again. Sorry. Which one? Uh, what was it? Um, uh, I have the book and I don't have it near me. Oh, oh okay. uh, it, it's, it's got something. Oh, uh, okay. Got yeah. Me. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It okay. was that, that particular episode. <laughs> okay. Well, universal set up a Howard the deck hotline. Oh, I can't imagine. In 1980, <laughs> I mean, because there were hotlines for everything at that yes, point. Yes, they were, yeah. In 1986, you could have called 1-900-410-D-U-C-K and heard Zian, or Zion promote the movie and character as Howard. Several pre-recorded messages were made, most of which involved rather terse conversations between the web-footed lead and his human co-stars. Sadly, that hotline no longer works. It was checked out, but the recordings (laughs) have found their way to YouTube. Awesome. So you guys could actually check that out if you want. I didn't look into that. I honestly, I didn't look at this. I always (laughs) say when I copy and paste, I do what Mark Menarden does on uh, Fat Man Beyond. I literally do that. I copy and paste everything. (laughs) Did I look at what I copy and pasted? Hell no. <laughs> I just put it in there. And Mark laughs at me when I say this to him. When I well, I only met the man twice. But it was funny. All right. Next up, the film landed one actor a role in Spaceballs. So uh, Chip Zine, or Zian, was the voice of Howard, but who was in the duck suit. Most of the time, it was actor Ed Gale. Initially hired as a stunt double, Gale was later asked to take over the role in almost every scene, which I mentioned. On set, he became well acquainted with first assistant director Dan Kulsrud. After Howard waddled into the theaters, the two reunited at a social function. There, Kulsrud introduced Gail to another associate of his, Spaceballs director, of course, Mel Brooks. On a DVD bonus feature, Gail says that Mel was looking at him and looking at me and asked, How'd you two meet? When Colesford answered Brooks, the funny man stood up and said, anybody who was in Howard the Duck can be in my movie. (laughs) Just like that, Gail was cast as one of the dinks in 
space balls. <laughs> so you can remember him going dink 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 dink. Yep. Dink dink. <laughs> oh my god. Awesome. So so after the movie tank, there was a shakeup at Universal. Howard mm-hmm. the Duck grossed sixteen point two million in the U.S. against a thirty-seven million dollar budget. <laughs> a lot of money down the toilet. Yep. Wave after wave of bad reviews certainly didn't help. Critics widely panned the movie, which went on to make Siskel and Ebert's worst of '86 list. Yeah. Then came Howard the Duck's four Razzie Award wins, including a tie with Princess Under the Cherry Moon for worst picture. <laughs> uh, I love Prince. That movie was bad. Yeah, yeah, uh, it was bad. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Purple Rain was great, but per- yeah, yeah, yeah. Under the Cherry Moon was terrible. Needless to say, Universal wasn't happy. Following Howard's release, Frank Price, who chaired the studio motion picture group, resigned. When Variety <laughs> covered the story, they ran the immortal headline: "Duck Cooks Price's Goose." Oh wow! Ugh. I feel bad for that man. All right. Well, last but not least, it is least, obviously. Uh, if Howard the Duck had been hit, Pixar might not exist. For George Lucas, the utter failure of Howard the Duck couldn't have come at a worse time. In 1986, he was still reeling from an expensive divorce and had plunged deeply into debt by building Skywalker Ranch, a scenic retreat with a $50 million price tag. He'd hoped that the profits from Howard the Duck would improve his financial situation. Instead, it's a horrible box office performance forced Lucas to sell off some of his assets. At the time, he owned an up-and-coming computer animation division with the aid of Apple CEO Steve Jobs. Several employees in that department created a spin-out corporation. Together, they paid Lucas $10 million in the process. Nowadays, we now the resultant company as Pixar Animation Studios. Hmm. Hmm. So it worked out in the end. Yeah, so Disney's got Lucas and Pixar. Yeah. (laughs) And Disney. (laughs) Yeah. Because Disney bought out both, if you think about it. And it might be Apple come sooning. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, All right. Well. This is the time in the podcast where we uh, talk about feedback and we get some feedback. So uh, we got some feedback from one of our (laughs) co-hosts and his name you will know, Mr. Steve Brown. So I'm going to play that right now. Hello, panels to pixels. This is Steve. And I, I don't know how long it's been since I watched Howard the Duck. It might be like since I first watched it ever. (laughs) Hey, and produced by George Lucas? Wow. <laughs> Breeders of the Lost Stork. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> Duck titties. <laughs> Where did he land? In Soho? <laughs> and Leah Thompson is the lead singer of a punk rock band. Love it. Satan Sluts Motorcycle Club. Oh, my goodness. How am I going to be able to stand this movie? Hello, Des and Mark. I hope you got to record this time. Uh, wow. I'm <laughs> just, this movie is just kicked off, and I don't know if I'm going to be sober by the end of it. Nope. <laughs> a master of quack foo. Her band is named Cherry Bomb. Wasn't there a real band, girl's band named Cherry Bomb? Earthquake PTSD. Yeah, my sister had that because uh, when she grew up in California. Well, actually, she went through the Alaskan earthquake in 63, so yeah. 64, yeah. My, my family lived there. They were stationed there at the time. I, I got their year wrong, that's all. I wasn't alive then, so, you know. Wow, his duck driver's license is from Washington, D.C. What did that say? The United States of Anna... Th- I, I didn't catch it. Money, I mean, in, in uh, Howard's wallet that Leah Thompson just went through. Oh, wow. Such a young Tim Robbins. Like, I almost didn't recognize him until I heard his voice. I couldn't... I can't believe he plays this professor or doctor or whoever that uh, this paleontologist that uh, Leah Thompson has brought Howard to. <laughs> he's just as smart as you are. Now I'm really depressed. <laughs> so now he's homeless and unemployed. How did he ever even be able to figure out a job application to begin with? But that's okay. It's Howard the Duck. Uh, yeah. So yeah, just that's where we're at. Oh no. And now it's duck hunting season. I'm getting choked up. She's singing a song about him, about her meeting with him. Oh, Leah Thompson. Oh, Deborah and Howard. Oh, 
Oh, Beverly and uh, Howard is about to take over this band. Oh, through his earring. And just like that, Howard is the girl's manager. <laughs> and that's Holly Robinson Pete, right? Yeah. Okay, I guess Tim Robbins is with Ronette, not Beverly, so that's good. Oh, Leah Thompson's pretty sexy. Oh, but there's the bad guys. Okay, I don't remember exactly how this movie turns out, but I remember he doesn't go home. So there's some sort of lie here that Jeffrey Jones's character is fabricating. Okay, there's no guard at the gate, no guard inside the building, and now this guy is bleeding out of his eyes. Yeah, this is bad. <laughs> Shoot to kill. He's extremely dangerous. Okay, so Jeffrey's, Jeffrey Jones' character is obviously whatever the big bad is. Oh no, if God intended to fly, he would have left us our, our wings. Oh no, and now... Uh, Howard's gonna try to fly. Oh yeah, I've, 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 yeah, yeah, I've forgotten something about Jeffrey Jones is it been inhabited by something. Oh yeah, and now that he's stepped actually acting into the uh, nuclear accelerator, yeah, he's something. I'm sorry I've gone long, but gosh, find your prehistoric fly, fly uh, Howard and fly. <laughs> All right, I'm over three minutes now and almost to four. So I'm going to let you guys finish it. You guys have got it. Uh, talk to you later. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, uh, we're going to take a break, but we're going to give Steve his ending, too. So <laughs> I'm going to throw this in here as our little break, and we'll come back and you get to hear Steve's ending. <laughs> with that well you get a little bit of taste of what with the soundtrack was like with the girls singing and uh playing their musical instruments so with that uh well we're gonna continue on to the end of what steve had to say because <laughs> he sent me two files and this is the ending one okay this had movie had way too many endings no wonder it flopped fucking goddamn fucking shit yeah, it's over now. You're done, Howard the Duck. Can we just end this movie? God dang it. Oh, obviously not. We got to have some sort of tag ending on here. Okay, cherry bomb ending grand. Play it or not, I don't fucking care. So obviously, Steve didn't really appreciate it <laughs> over the time, which is, I understand. I, I actually understand a lot of people. He probably what, um, like if he was on here, probably be upset about it too. Probably say it in a nicer way, but uh, wow. Yeah. I, I feel the same way at certain times. I was like, if I'm drunk and I'm watching this movie, <laughs> wow, I would say the same freaking thing. But, uh, you know, uh, Steve is very honest and, uh, I, I appreciate what he has to say. Uh, the movie, like I said, does you and I both, feel the same way we look at it nostalgic and we appreciate what we got out of it mm -hmm. uh like what i got out of it was like the music i love listening to the soundtrack and going reliving the comedic moments uh everything else that's going on within it but you know if steve was on he'd probably be like i really didn't want to watch that movie <laughs> and I'd, i i would believe it too it gets to the point where it's starts out with the nostalgia and then there's probably when you get about three quarters in it's it, it like you said it could be done it could be done now it can be done <laughs> and actually if marvel was smart they would actually do a whole howard the duck hold on mr kevin smith who i actually had a guest on here <laughs> was actually trying to get an animated version 
for Netflix, Amazon, everything. He, they, they were in negotiations at one point and they never got it. Hopefully by uh, my birthday weekend, I actually would be able to talk to uh, Kevin because I set it up. I have to pay tickets and everything. I've met Kevin multiple times, had him on my podcast on an interview. He knows me. Uh, usually people he knows will say, he'll say to them, visually he'll know the, their face or like remember their name spontaneously. Uh, uh, majority of the time he'll say, hey, Captain, or hey, Mark. And <laughs> uh, I, I have to talk to him about this because I really want to talk to him about it on my birthday weekend. That uh, reminds me, I, uh, Leah Thompson, actually, I was reading, she's been trying to get a new version made with her as director for years like really just over Caroline and over again in the city yeah and uh, i'm sorry I, i'm being nostalgic at that point too yeah but leah thompson was in a tv show called caroline yeah. in the city and she's directed a lot of television since then too yes she, she, has. she directed some at picard i mean <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, go figure, right? Yeah, uh, we're Picard fans too, and I still have to watch the the last season. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's it, it's surprising. I have to I have to talk to Kevin about that, about what happened with that. Get a little bit more gist about that. But uh, like you said, uh, Leah had was trying to get this promoted too, uh, which would be interesting. I'm hoping one day to go to a convention and get to <laughs> meet meet Miss Leah Thompson. And talk to her about Howard the Duck. Everybody will be like, Back to the Future. Oh my God, you're so <laughs> great. Oh my God, you were great in Red Dawn. I, I could see me and Wendy being there. She'd be like, Red Dawn, Red Dawn. And I'll be like, Howard the Duck. <laughs> and and Ben be looking at me on the other side going, What the hell? Back to the Future, dude. <laughs> yeah, you, but, you have to start out with this is not a diss. I loved Howard the Duck. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your experience. Okay. <laughs> I, I would love to talk to her about anything that she's done in film, but uh well right now with the writer strikes, we can't really get anything into play and we can't really get interviews. I would definitely reach out. So I'm hoping hopefully this doesn't run that long and we get something and somewhere with these people. But uh, I will reach out nonetheless. It'll be fun. What could it hurt? All they could say is no. Right. Exactly. So, all right. So uh, with that, we're going to move on to uh, some uh, Facebook feedback. Paul Williams from What Lurks Behind Podcast Zero says, Hilarious, fun Marvel flick that I don't need to watch 1,200 hours of movies and shows <laughs> beforehand to enjoy the small Easter eggs or some plot point that will have no bearing on the experience other than to say, Hey, I got that reference. Ha 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 ha. No, but seriously, this movie what has it all hilarious moments. Tim Robbins first feature role kick ass score from the legendary John Barry. And Paul mm -hmm. loves uh, to go with his, uh, the guys who do the scores and everything catchy theme written by thomas dolby all right we got that directed by the messiah of evil quote-unquote director willard hayek and best of all awesome stop-motion animation from the mad god that was the name of the movie <laughs> himself phil tippett oh wait did i forget leah thompson <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I did not. This movie is so dear to my heart. And a big heart emoji. Thank you, Paul Williams. We love you. And yes, everybody should check out What Lurks Behind Podcast Zero. And that can be found on the next level radio online.com. Or you can just search that in your podcast player of choice and just search for what lurks behind podcast zero you could find him on facebook and that would be facebook.com forward slash what lurks behind podcast zero there you go and i will leave all that information in the podcast notes and the youtube notes next one would be ben elmore who i just had on adrenaline cinema podcast and we covered space camp from 1986 as well which also had who else leah thompson yep so uh Dan and I covered that and our love for that particular movie as well. So check that out on Adrenaline Cinema Podcast. 
But he states, I watched this a lot as a kid. As an adult, it was 100% not appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey Jones was terrifying in this movie. But I have fond memories. So, all right. Thank you, Ben, for setting that feedback in it is so cool to have other people on i'm looking to have ben and his brother and his uh, sister-in-law on as well for future podcasts as well for both adrenaline cinema podcasts as well as panels to pistols so uh keep that in mind uh we'll have the regular crew that we always have which would be frank rodriguez and rob moda and as well as you heard before Mr. Steve Brown. So uh, with that, we're going to move right along into podcast recommendations. So Des, do you have any podcast recommendations? Well, you have already mentioned one of them. Okay. We have the Run for Your Life podcast with our friends, Paik and Daphne. Yep. I think they just did one on 28 Days Later, which I just started listening to this morning. Oh, it's amazing. I listened to it. Yeah. We have another one, which is the Revisited Pod with Ben and Kristen uh, right now they're doing lost and mm-hmm. I hope I don't get in trouble, but they've already announced it when they're done with lost. They're going to do Ted Lasso. Yeah. It's been so, announced. So yeah. two of my favorite shows back to back. So <laughs> yeah. Send feedback though. If you guys are not into Ted Lasso, go watch it. You and have to watch it. <laughs> go watch it and then do it episodically when they do it and then send in the feedback. That's homework for you guys. And uh, well, you already mentioned it with uh, with Run for Your Lives, the cast of us, they've mm-hmm. been doing a little bit of a mix with Wilhelm and with uh, Podcastka. So uh, they did uh, what was it, uh, Barbenheimer? Oh yeah, and that was pretty cool. So I got to see Oppenheimer, and I really thought it was done very well. I I, I really did enjoy it. I really had a good time. Uh, all the history and everything mm-hmm. I, that's really what captivated me and the amount of star power that was in that particular movie and i believe that uh ben and Kristen did oppenheimer and uh i think on podcast on that side they did uh the barbie, barbie. Movie, mm-hmm. which i haven't yet to see <laughs> i I'm, I'm still gonna see it i'm gonna listen to that particular podcast when i do see that particular movie I think Penny and maybe Jason or somebody else were were involved in that, but uh, definitely uh, it's a it's a mutual col- collaboration with uh, Wilhelm and the Podcast Network. So check that out for us here right now to submit your feedback because we like feedback. If you can, we we got some feedback, and I was <laughs> really happy about that this week. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, we can be heard on Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, or whatever podcast player of choice. If ratings are available, especially with Apple Podcasts, please give a rating or a review. It helps us a lot. So that way it gets us noticed. So uh, please do so. You could find us on Facebook, and we have a Facebook group. All you have to do is go to facebook.com forward slash panels to pixels. I like to put in what we're covering at the time with an image and saying, hey, we're covering this week. And if you like to just leave your comments in down below and we'll bring them up and we'll read them on the podcast. Right now, we're currently well, this I put in for like a couple of weeks, if not a few (laughs) weeks, but it took some time to get around to it. But we've been covering Good Omens season two. So we're going to move on to uh, a couple of other things when Loki comes out and things like that when it comes to more Marvel stuff. So uh, but if there's something that you would like us to cover, please put it in the Facebook group, too, as well. You could just post it. Anybody can post anything. We could be found on YouTube. All you have to do is search for Panels to Pixels podcast on YouTube. Follow us there. Subscribe. Ring the bell so that you get notified <laughs> once we're there and we have a new uh, episode up. And just comment in the uh, comments below and we'll read them too. I get them as well there. You can email us with anything that you want. Comments about this particular podcast or what we're currently covering, which would be episodically, which is Good Omens Season 2. All you have to do is email us at panels to pixels one at gmail.com. And that's panels. Two is spelled out T-O and pixels and then the number one at gmail.com. 
could just write out a regular formulated texted email. Or if you feel lazy like I do, or Steve, <laughs> and he all he did was record himself and send it as an attachment to panels to pixels one at gmail.com. That's how I literally got that voicemail. So uh, we all have these smart devices. You have your phones, you have a tablet, you could easily do it, or even your computer. That's the best way you could do. We also put out an Instagram. So I like to promote what we're doing. I promoted this on Instagram, actually released the last episode and sent in the links too as well. Uh, All you have to do is go to Instagram, like us, follow us, and we could be found at panels to pixels podcast all complete one word at panels to pixels podcast and then you can leave a comment in the image below when i say hey we're covering this next and then you can say whatever you want and then we'll read it but that's about it and now we're at that point where <laughs> where listeners can hear you des you've been on a lot of stuff you've been on I've adrenaline been cinnamon you. podcast you've been on wilhelm you've been uh, i've never been on wilhelm you haven't been on Wilhelm? No. Nope. And I'm not going to say anything else until Ben puts me on it. Anyway. Uh, All right, now, Ben, you need to put I, him on Wilhelm. What's wrong I, with you? I, I mean, I've, I've done um, your two podcasts. I've done Revisited. Yes. What else? You had to be on podcasts a couple of times. Oh, yeah. Um, Run for Your Lives, I've done a couple of times. There you go. That's, that's right. There you go. But that's pretty much it. Yeah. Um, I, like I said, I am not a podcaster. I just want to go on and talk with my friends every once in a while, and that works for me. <laughs> well, that's the whole point of podcasting is ju- just jumping on with your friends and having a good time and talking about this stuff that we love. And a lot of people like to hear it, too, which is so yeah. funny. All right. So, well, that's where people could hear Daz. If you want to hear Daz, all you have to do is contact <laughs> him at... No, I'm not going to say that. Uh, all right. Well, you could hear me... Obviously, you could hear me here on Panels to Pixels podcast, as always, as well as Steve, Rob, Frank, Kat, Lara. Wow. We have to get the Witcher stuff out there soon because Lara and Kat want to do that. Steve and I are going to continue our stuff with Good Omens. Rob will fill in on occasion whenever he feels he could step in because he's doing Fantasy Picks Movie Edition, where as well as I jump in on as well, too. Uh, to help out with his podcast. So you can check that out on the pirate core entertainment.com. It's called pirate core entertainment. So look at the notes. You'll see them as well. You could hear me there. Adrenaline cinema podcast as well. Uh, I think the last thing that we put out last two things were lost boys with Rima and space camp with my friend Ben Elmore. All right, well, that's it for us for this particular podcast. I'm Mark. And I'm Des. And same podcast, different panel, different pixel. And this was Panel Slippers Podcast. And we'll see you on the next panel. Bye. Good night, everybody. Goodbye. Good night. <laughs>